Hey everyone, today we're going to look at this idea of magnetic fields and combining magnetic fields due to various current carrying wires. What you can see here is a demonstration of what the magnetic field looks like around a current carrying wire. We know it makes magnetic field loops, putting your thumb in the direction of current and curling your hands in the direction of the magnetic field. So what happens when we have two wires next to each other? What about the magnetic field at different locations in space? Well, to find the net magnetic field, you'd have to sum up the magnetic field from both wires. So let me draw loops around the right wire and the left wire here. Both have current coming out towards me. So again, put your thumb in the direction of the current and curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. And this magnetic field goes counterclockwise. Go to the left current and the same thing happens for the left wire. We have got two counterclockwise magnetic fields. So what they would ask is, well, what's the magnetic field strength at different locations, like at the origin, or on the right side of the right wire, or the left side of the left wire, or that point P like they have up above. If we start with point P that they've already drawn here for us, the right wire, again, has a magnetic field loop like this in the counterclockwise direction, but the magnetic field at that moment we take is the tangent line to that circle. So that's why you have that B from the right wire down into the left. For the left wire, the magnetic field loop is still counterclockwise, but again, you take the tangent line at that location at point P to find the magnetic field from the left wire. From that, and using some of your geometry, you should be able to sum up the total net magnetic field. You can see that both magnetic fields have a left component, and one has an up and one has a down component. Let's pick another location. Let's pick the origin right here. Well, if I go from the right wire, I can see that my magnetic field at that moment is pointing straight down. That's B from the right. And if I spin my hand from the left wire at that moment, my magnetic field is pointing up. According to magnetic field strength for wires, it's mu zero i over two pi r. Both wires are the same distance from that highlighted dot. They're the same current, so they would have the same magnetic field strength. So if they have the same strength but in the opposite direction, we would see no net magnetic field right there in the middle. So if we were over here at this location, you could do the same thing again. The magnetic field from the right wire this time is pointing up, and if you do the left wire, you curl around, you also see magnetic field up. Now it's a lot weaker because it's further away, but you're gonna sum and add those two magnetic fields pointing up. If you go all the way on the far side of the left, you're gonna see both magnetic fields pointing down at that location. Finding the net magnetic field from wires is not too hard. It's just like finding net electric fields we did for charges, but this time you gotta think of the magnetic field loops that are made around the wires. If current carrying wires create magnetic fields, those magnetic fields should interact with each other. They should attract or repel each other, which means that these current carrying wires will experience forces when they're next to another current carrying wire. So if we go again with the example we have here, I've got two currents in the same direction. The question is, how much force does each wire feel? So let's say that both currents are going into the page. So if they're both going into the page, the question is, what is the force each wire feels due to the magnetic field? So I'll make the magnetic field for the right wire in blue, and if I put my thumb into the page and turn, I want to see that the magnetic field from the right wire points up on the left wire. And I'll do the other wire in red. So if I again put my finger in the direction of the left wire and curl it, I'm going to see a magnetic field down due to the left wire. But now the question is, what about the forces? Well, from the current balance, we were able to see that I, L cross B is how we find the force for our magnetic field strength. We know the direction of the magnetic fields. I know the direction of the current. Now we just need to find the force. Remember, I, L is where you put your fingers. You're gonna curl into the magnetic field, into the B, and wherever your thumb points is where the force points. So let's start with the right wire. The right wire has current into the page. You're curling your fingers down and you get a force that points to the left. So the right wire feels a force towards the left wire. Let's do the reverse. The left wire, put your fingers in the direction of current, curl up into the magnetic field, and you see a force towards the right wire. So really, those forces are in towards each other. 
So what you could say here is that currents moving in the same direction actually attract each other. And how much would they attract each other? Newton's third law is going to tell us that. That if one wire pulls on the other wire, the other wire must pull back with an equal and opposite force. Now if we wanted to solve for how much force that was, right here in our force equation, let's find the force in the left wire. That would be the current in the left wire multiplied by the length of the left wire multiplied by the magnetic field strength. Well, the magnetic field strength that it is experiencing comes from the right wire. While the right wire has a magnetic field due to mu zero i in the right wire over to pi r. So when you go to find your force in the left wire there, you gotta take the current from the left, the length, and multiply by the magnetic field strength from the right wire. And it'd be vice versa if you're solving for the force in the right wire. You just switch out the currents and solve for the magnetic field strength. They'd be a certain r distance apart. The wire has a particular length and you can see that the currents are from two different objects. One is the current that's feeling the force and one is the current that is creating the magnetic field. Let's do the reverse. Let's send currents in the opposite direction. So now I have currents going the opposite direction. Let's go with the right wire. Right wire sends magnetic field in the counterclockwise direction and the left wire sends magnetic field in the clockwise direction. Both magnetic fields now are down on each wire. Well, again, we go with FILB, and you put your fingers in the direction of current, curl with the magnetic field, and now you see that there's a force away from the, on the left wire from the right wire. And the right wire has current out, curl down, and you can see there's a force to the right. So these two forces, again, due to third law, are equal and opposite. So we see the two wires repel each other when currents are in opposite directions. So the rule for what happens with current carrying wires and the forces they feel is you can draw the current wires and look for the way the forces push or pull on each other. Or you can remember this, that opposite currents repel while same currents attract, which sounds 100% reverse from what we knew for charges. Opposite charges attracted and like charges repelled. So of course I'll leave a link here for the forces on current carrying wires. Uh, the people at MIT have long current carrying wires here and they're going to send currents parallel to each other and anti-parallel to each other so they're sending them in series and parallel. You can see that when they throw the switch you get either repulsion or attraction when those switches are thrown. So with a magnetic field loop, and a magnetic field loop, remember, creates magnetic field that points out of the center of the loop and around the outside of the loop. So if I would send currents through loops of wire, you would see a strong magnetic field right through the center and weaker fields further from the center of that loop. So let's try this again, but with current carrying loops to discuss attraction and repulsion. So in this one, let's say the currents are going in the same direction. We know that same currents should attract each other while opposites will repel each other. So let's see that that is true. I'm gonna turn these two wires on their side. So here we go. We've got the current coming out of the page at the top and into the page across the bottom. So if I curl my hands in the directions I know, I get magnetic fields to point in these directions around each of my loops. Now, if we remember that we look at those loops and we kind of look at them as tiny little bar magnets, we can see that there is a bar magnet right here that has a north end since the lines are leaving it and a south end since the lines are coming back in. Over here, same thing, I'm getting another bar magnet with a north and a south. So technically when you have two current carrying loops in the same direction, they create these two little bar magnets that have opposite poles staring at each other. And we know that opposites want to attract. So now I have currents going in the opposite direction for these two loops. One out of the page at the top and one out of the page at the bottom. Doing your loops creates this type of magnetic field for the left wire and for the right wire I get magnetic fields like this. Again, creating little bar magnets. I can create a north pole and a south pole but for the opposite current, I'm gonna create another north pole and another south pole. And now you can see I technically have two little north poles pushing on each other. And when we have two north poles, 
we're going to get them to repel. The repulsion is when currents are opposite and attraction is when currents are the same. I like to think of it this way rather than try to memorize that acronym because I know I'm going to mess it up and I know I'm going to screw up. So taking several current carrying loops, we can actually do the superposition again for the strength of the magnetic field as long as let's say our currents are going in the same direction. We're going to have a magnetic field from wire one point to the right, the magnetic field from wire three point to the right, and the magnetic field from wire two points to the right and is the strongest because it's the closest. At the tops and bottoms, we're going to get some cancellation. You can see wire two points to the left and wire one and three actually point to the right. So we don't really get a strong magnetic field outside. We get a strong magnetic field right through the center. So again, here are two current carrying loops. You can see the tops here are dots coming out towards you and the bottom are two X's with the current going in. If I would have multiple loops with current running in the same direction, I would create a very, very dense, strong magnetic field right through the middle. And if you look at the arrows, you can see the bar magnet there of north and south. So what we do when we coil wire upon itself and send current through it is we create what we call a solenoid. A solenoid creates a nice, uniform, straight magnetic field through the middle of this loop of wire. And it's similar to like a capacitor. Remember, a capacitor had two charged plates and had a nice uniform electric field set up between those two plates. Now we get a nice uniform magnetic field through the center of this wire. If I wanted to solve for the magnetic field strength inside of this, we use BS of R to solve for the magnetic field at the center of one loop. It was that mu zero I over two R. But now we've got multiple loops that we'd have to deal with. So you couldn't just write the one for at the center. So you'd have to do this. You'd have to do that BOS of R one more time, but you'd have to sum it up for all the little amounts of DI. DI being all the currents all the way along the length of the solenoid. So you can see DI is written down here as NI DZ, DZ being the length of the solenoid. N is a little subscript that we like to say is the number of turns per unit length. So this is how many times you spin the wire around that solenoid and L is how long you make the solenoid. So there is a very, very long uh, derivation for trying to get the magnetic field strength at the center using this integration. But what you end up getting is this. You get the magnetic field at the center of the solenoid is mu zero little n times I. You need to know how many turns per length the solenoid has, the permeability of free space, and the current that you send through that solenoid. You can see again, picture on the left is a solenoid, coils of wire with current th going through them set up a nice strong magnetic field. And on the right, you can see the bar magnet. Both looked very, very similar with their magnetic field strengths. And when we actually graph the magnetic field from a solenoid, we see that it actually drops off by about half when we reach the ends of the solenoid. It's strongest in the middle, and just like a bar magnet, the fields start to arc out and get weaker as we get further away from the center. We said there's got to be a better way to do this, and the better way would be using Gauss. Some of you said let's use magnetic flux rather than trying to use all this calculus to find magnetic field strength. So let's do a little recap on what Gauss said for electric fields and apply that to magnetic fields. What Gauss said is that you surround charges with what he called a Gaussian surface. And you looked for the electric flux based on this. You would say the integral of E dot dA to solve just for the flux, not for the charge enclosed or anything, just for how many field lines are passing out and coming back in. So if you look down here at the picture, you can see that all the field lines here are leaving the surface for that positive charge. But on the left side, we have all the field lines coming back in. So everything that leaves is coming back in. The total net flux equals zero. And the way we can say this is, well, it's a dipole. There's a positive and negative charge. The total charge enclosed is zero. So of course our flux is gonna be zero. So Gal said, well, let me do that with a magnet. He said, well, I'm gonna surround the magnet or current carrying loop with a Gaussian surface. But again, you can see that all the field lines coming in on the back equal all the field lines that leave at the end. So Gauss's law for magnetism simply states this, that the magnetic flux around any magnet is B dot dA instead of E dot dA, and it equals zero. 
always. So right here kind of puts uh, a big hindrance to finding the magnetic monopole. We see that any time we have a magnet and we try to use Gauss's law, we're always going to get field lines to leave and we're going to get those field lines to come back in. The net magnetic flux will always be zero, which means that Gauss isn't going to help us solve for magnetic field strengths. We're going to have to turn to someone else and we'll do that next time.